So I will speak about my actions inspired by two of my favorite mathematicians. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Jordan, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, coming. It's great to have everybody here. As, as always with my talks, I encourage questions, comments. If I'm not making things clear. I'd rather not get through the end of everything and make things clear than rush through everything and have everybody be confused. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, as Doran in, in indicated, uh, this is going to be a talk that is inspired by a lot of, you know, well, you know dare we say ancient mathematics, at least ancient in, in some sense, that uh, this is going to be inspired a lot by the work of, of uh, two mathematicians. So Sylvester, uh, back in the eight, late 1800s, did a lot of work with partitions. Uh, and he was also uh, followed by uh, Major Percy McMahon, who, who came up with a very interesting partition identity, uh, among other things. And so basically the point of this talk is going to be looking at some new partition identities that, can, that are inspired by McMahon's partition identity and the methods that we're going to be using uh, to prove them are going to be bijective methods and those bijective methods are going to be uh, following, using very, making very heavy use of, uh, of, of some work of Sylvester. So, so that, is the, that is the setup for, for the talk. Um, so anyways, uh, without further ado, as every partition talk, I must define partitions. In case you have not seen it before. And so the, you know, just to show partitions, uh, let's say four, how many ways can we write four as the sum of positive integers where we don't care about order? So there are four ways to write four. Uh, sorry, five ways to write four. Let's, 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 let's uh, get that count right. Um, and so then there's lots of things that we can do with, uh, with, with partitions. My favorite thing to do is to look for partition identities, which is when partitions into one type is equal to, uh, for any given n, is equal to the number of partitions into a second type. And so, one of the, probably about the most famous one, is Euler's odd distinct theorem, which says the number of partitions of n, when you only use uh, odd parts, so in this case, uh, is 3 plus 1 and 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Uh, this is, so there's two ways to write, th write for only using odd parts. So this is the same number of ways to write it for in distinct parts, where we don't repeat any parts whatsoever, which is just 4 and 3 plus 1. So there's two ways here, two ways here. Euler's theorem tells us that those two numbers will always, always agree no matter what number you start here. Um, and so, uh, there's lots of ways to prove Euler's theorem. This is a, uh, probably the, the generating function proof might be my single favorite proof in all of math just because of how slick it is. You do, you do no work whatsoever, it feels, and then you end up proving the theorem. Uh, <laughs> but this is, as I alluded to before, this is a talk about bijections. And so, there's a, there's a we want to think about how to prove this bijectively. And so the main bijective proof, uh, the, the one that most people think of when they think of a bijective proof of Euler, you know, if, if you've only seen one bijective proof of, of Euler before, you've probably seen Glacier's uh, bijection. And that is one where you basically just chop parts in half or glue, glue duplicates together and stuff like that. That's not the one I'm going to be talking about today uh, because as it turns out, uh, there's a different bijection that is due to Sylvester, that is, has some very desirable properties. And so I'm going to be using Sylvester's bijection uh, to prove uh, some, uh, some new partition identities bijectively. And, and it will turn out Sylvester's bijection has a very important property that will be a key ingredient in the proof. So as for Sylvester's bijection, And so this is going to be a case in which 
I'm going to go through this at, at a high level. I'm just going to basically just show an example or two and say, okay, you can see what the what the bijection is doing. I'm not going to worry about proving it is a bijection. I'm going to show one direction of, of the map and say verify the details for, for yourself to, to see that it is in fact a bijection. And the way that we're going to be doing this is we're going to be going from the odd part side to the distinct part side. And so, uh, so this is going to be an odd, odd to distinct. And so the, the way that I want to describe this is that we want to basically, for all our odd parts, we want to fold them in half. And so if that doesn't make sense, well, let me do an example of this. Let's say that we have taken that our partition that we start with is 7 plus 5 plus 3 plus 3, so this is into odd parts. And so for each part successfully, starting with the biggest and going, going down, we're going to take 7, we're going to, so we kind of think of a line with 7 dots, and then we're going to take and fold it in half. And I guess I'm going to not use dots, I'm going to use boxes instead here, but okay, so we have a line of 7 boxes that now is folded in half right here. And we're going to keep doing this for each one in succession. We're going to take five, row of five boxes, bend it in half, glue, stick it here, stick it here, stick it here, so on and so forth. So now the five, so here is, so here's our seven, here's our five, here's our three, and then we have one more three that sticks on down out there. So if the first job is to draw this picture, and now to give the bijection, we're going to read this picture in a, uh, let me confess, I, I think the first time you see it, it's a rather non-intuitive way to read it. But you start in the, in the top right corner, you draw back to the top left corner, and then you draw diagonally down as far as you can go along that main diagonal. So that's a little bit off center there, that, but that, that is, we just go down this, this diagonal. And then we do the same thing. We start, now we just reverse it. We move to the bottom left. We draw up as far as we can. Oh, oh but we can't draw there. We have to stop when we hit something we've already uh, drawn. And now we draw diagonally down as far as we can go. And we keep doing this. Uh, so we, now we're back to the top right. Draw here to here. And bottom bottom left is here and so and we put dots everywhere now our job is just to read off how many how many dots are in each of these uh, little shapes that we drew so uh, almost kind of looks sevens if you tilt them in, in the right way <laughs> so one two three four five six seven is the first one then we have one two three four five six then we have one, two, three, four, and then we have a one here. And so seven plus five plus three plus three gets mapped to seven plus six plus four plus one. Uh, that, that's an example of, of this map that Sylvester came up with. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, maybe now is a good time just to do a little bit of historical note here. So this is, uh, so, so uh, Sylvester, uh, this was, he, he did this work during his time at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the, the, the first, he was the first math professor, correct, at Johns Hopkins, I believe, yes. Um, and and uh, he had a lot of graduate students. Uh, uh, Franklin was working on, on partitions with him. And, and uh, this uh, bijection, first appeared in a paper with a rather remarkable title, A Constructive Theory of Partitions Arranged in Three Acts and Interact in an Exodian. And the language in this paper is, is but let's just say that they don't write math papers like, like this anymore. It, this is very highly, uh, highly recommended reading if you want to see, if you want to see Sylvester quoting from Shakespeare in the middle of a math paper. Uh, it is experience unlike any other paper that you've seen. Then also before Sylvester, he was unique. Yes, 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 yes. So Sylvester so was a very, very special mathematician. So, okay, so, so back to this bijection. 
this bijection ends up preserving, as I said, the reason I care about this bijection in the context of what we're coming up with, it does certain things. And the things that it does, well, so this is just two things that are just purely coincidental here. Uh, it happened to preserve the number of parts, that won't always happen. It happened to preserve the largest part, that won't always happen. But there is one thing that it does preserve here. And so it does preserve the following thing. So, so a nice feature of Sylvester and his bijection is Here's some notation that is very much non-standard, I just came, came up with it. So let capital lambda 1 be the sum of, here my lowercase lambdas are representing the uh, individual parts in the partition. Lambda 1 is the largest, and we, then we go down. So let lambda 1 be the sum of all the odd index parts. Let capital lambda 2 be the sum of all the end, even index parts. And then, uh, capital lambda 1 minus capital lambda 2 is equal to the number of parts in the original partition before we did the bijection. And so in this example, so lambda 1 is equal to 7 plus 4 is 11. Lambda 2 is 6 plus 1, which is equal to 7. 11 minus 7 is 4, and that indeed there were four parts in the original partition. Now the, the easy way to kind of see this is that uh, why, why this has happened, we can actually see that from the picture, because everything, the parts, so here's lambda 1, here's lambda 2, here's lambda 3, here's lambda 4, and we keep putting 5 and 6 and so on and so forth. So all the odd index ones are above the main diagonal, all the even index ones are below the main diagonal, but then the main diagonal belongs to the odd index ones. And so how many boxes are there on the main diagonal? One for every part in the original partition. And so this is the nice feature that, that we're going to be exploiting uh, later on in our proof, that there will be a key step in which we very much will care about that. Any questions right now? Okay, so, so far, I guess, first thing accomplished, our, our first job was talk about Sylvester. Now we're going to talk about Major McMahon. Uh, so his partition identity, I, he did uh, a lot of things, uh, he, and he was very much an experimentalist at heart. Uh, he, uh, he, he famously verified the Rajaranjan identities up to 89 terms and concluded, ah, it must be true, you know, but he didn't, even if he didn't know how to prove it right away. So, a, a, a very, very good pre-computer uh, experimentalist. And he a computer experimentalist, and he was a computer at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, McMahon uh, was, was uh, fabulous at being able to do mental arithmetic very, very quickly. Uh, probably one of the best, in, if not the best in England at the time. So, uh, McMahon's identity is the following. So, it's the, so it says that the number of partitions into parts congruent to 0, 2, 3, or 4 mod 6 is equal to uh, and of course, for uh, number of partitions, we actually have n here, is equal to the number of partitions of n with no ones. So you can use, so uh, in, this, in this bunch, so, so the top part is, is clearly in this bunch, you can use any numbers you want. You can use them as many times as you want, except you're just not allowed to use one. And then we can also, there is a third way that we can think about this. Uh, and this is that, this is also equal to the number of partitions of n, where no part appears exactly once.
And so uh, going from here to either one of these is the main part of the theorem. Going from this one to this one is a little easy exercise we're about to do because this basically just comes from taking the conjugate of a partition. We draw out and we look at it instead of re reading it you know, by rows, we read it by columns, then these two things are going to correspond to each other. So here is a, okay, so here is three plus two, and we, we can read this as three plus two, so there is no ones here. If we, uh, uh, let's see, no part, uh, appears exactly what what is hmm. the largest part does not appear exactly no uh, uh what what has gone wrong here uh is that second one supposed to be no ones or is it no part appears exactly once no oh sorry so so this no ones is only a part of something else ah yes 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 uh, I, I forgot the most important thing here. Not a good thing to do on the seal, but who cares? Because we can patch this up. Hey, we, you know, this list, you know, we can always check our work. I'm teaching classes. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I make lots of mistakes in class. The important thing to do is to realize when something has gone wrong. So that, that, is, you know, that, that, that is an important thing. So if something has gone wrong, what was the thing that I completely forgot? Uh, not only can you not have any ones, but you can't also have, yeah, ha you, you can't have any uh, two consecutive parts. Uh, so three plus two is very much not allowed under list. Let's pass this up to a four plus two, and now this goes away with a two plus two plus one plus one. And we can see then, you know, what, this is a great, because I was about to do a counter example to this, where we could see, because we did have a consecutive part that did result in a one. And so this is the way, the no consecutive parts is, is maybe like the more natural feeling way to, for, for me to think about it. But as it turns out, like this third way to express it is the most useful for when we actually want to prove things with it. When you can have a petition, so no. Yeah, and then so, so Doran brings up a very good point here, which is that uh, one, one very important difference, if you ever heard me talk about partition identities before, I, I usually start off talking about Rajas Ramanjan identities, other things like that. Um, and also in Euler is that we, we often say it's like, oh, we, you're not allowed to repeat any parts or maybe you can only have you know, every part appear you know, most twice or three times or something like that. McMahon does not have any condition like that whatsoever. So you can put in as many, you can have as many fives as you want. You can have a million fives. That is completely fine to have in your, in, in your partition. The thing that you're just not allowed to have is, is, uh, is any consecutive parts. Okay, so uh, questions, comments right now. So again, please break. The first one, could you clarify the number of partitions of n into parts is congruent to like uh, so, so, so the only numbers that you're allowed to use are are stuff that's congruent to twos, threes, fours, and zeros, mod sixes. So so you can have it so you can use twos, you can use threes, you can use fours, you can use sixes, you can use eights, nines so on and so forth, you can have those occur as many times as you want. You just can't use five, you know, ones and fives okay. and sevens. So, so, so that's it, very similar in spirit to the odd partitions over here. So here, here this is saying you're only allowed to use odd numbers. That one is saying you're only allowed to use you know, numbers in these residue classes, mod six. So for four, there's two of them? So, so, so sorry, say it again. Uh, so for your case of four, is there two? Ah, uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's check this. So uh, we can't use, so four certainly works okay. in that. Three plus one, okay, we can't use a one, so that's gone. Two plus two, that works. When, when we can't use a one, so those two are gone, so. Okay, so that's, so two should then be the same as the number of partitions of n with no ones and non-consecutive parts. Okay, so, and then four and two oh, plus two are again. Okay. No, no ones and no consecutive parts, and then no pair appears exactly once is going to be two plus three and the all fours. I'm sorry, that is the four ones. Okay. So, 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 so thank, thanks for suggesting that. That's good that we can uh, that that we can verify that we know what's going on here. Uh, any other questions, comments right now? Okay. So next thing on our agenda is is so. Uh, 
again, have to touch on the experimentation side of this. Uh, so this is some, um, and when we start talking about a family of partition identities that it was originally uh, uh, conjectured by computer experimentation, a project I was working on together with Shashank Kanade and Deb Nandi. Uh, and, so, and so there's a whole family of them. If I have time today, I'll just write down the, the, the general family. I'm going to just write down work on everything in just, in just one particular example and hopefully you know, the, the infinite family will kind of be clear what, what's, what's going on. And so the following, so through computer experimentation we managed to conjecture the following identity and then uh, this provides, you know, the rest of the talk will be my objective proof of this. So uh, new identity. So the number of partitions of n into parts congruent to 0, 2, 4, and 5 mod 6. And this is also equal to the number of partitions of n. with the following property that odd parts cannot be exactly one or exactly three greater than the even part. And just like we had up there, we had a no ones condition we also have and no ones and no threes. And then we also have this is by going to a conjugation. So, so, so let me just pause right now. So this, this the number of partitions con in parts congruent 0, 2, 4, 5. That should feel like the original McMahon. Number of partitions and with odd parts cannot be exactly 1 or exactly 3 greater than even part. That was inspired by the middle condition, you know, like the experimentation. So there, it's, you can't have any part one greater than a different part. Here is we're treating the odds and the even separately. So, you're, so you can't have, for example, 7 plus 6, the odd would be 1 greater than the even. You can't have 7 plus 4, the odd would be 3 greater than even. But you can have, you know, uh, something like 8 plus 7. You know, there's nothing here that says that even can't be the bigger one. And then similarly, we can conjugate this. The number of partitions of n with the following property. A part can appear exactly once or exactly thrice. Uh, only if there is an even number of parts greater than it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that one's faint moving, okay. <laughs> Matthew, how many times? I, I, I'm teaching in, 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 these, in these lecture halls this semester that have that one that can be funny, so I, I've, I've been spoiled. Okay, so again, I, I'm not going to justify, but this is again just going by conjugations. So that if you think about this part, you know, these partitions, they all can okay, be conjugated, ends up with this property. So uh, you can only have a part appear exactly one time or exactly three times if there's an even number of parts bigger than it. So uh, it, it can appear exactly twice, that's no problem, or it can appear exactly four, five, six, seven, you know, ever many times bigger than that, that's no problem either. Okay, uh, questions, comments right now? So this is new as far as you know? This is, this is new as, as, as far as far as I know. Do you ask the experts? Uh, we have been doing a, some circulation and, and uh, nothing as, you know, I, you know, in any event, you know, you can, one can never be absolutely sure, but I, I, I suspect that this and really and, and the entire family are, are, are in fact new. Uh -huh.
So yeah, please, John. Do we know whether the number of these partitions is always bigger or smaller than the number of the McMahon? Uh, this, this feels like uh, that because th and we're just looking at the product side, what different, you know, we have a 3 mod 6 versus a 5 mod 6. It feels like that, you know, eventually the 3 mod 6s should be, uh, it should, should, should win out over the 5 mod 6s. There might be some weird cases early on, but eventually that should happen, I, I, I would suspect. Okay, anything else? Okay, so here is going to be the, uh, I don't need this, everybody's saying this side of the room, so don't need this anymore. So, in this, so, so we're going to now come up with, I'll describe the bijection. And, and again, I'll describe in the bijection of going from something that's written like this to something that's written like this. So, from the 0 to uh, 4, 5, mod 6 to the conjugates. Let me say here, these are the conjugates. And so, 0, zero 2, 4, 5, mod 6. This is not the right way to think about it. This is really evens or 5 mod 6. That, that, is, that is the right way to think about this. Uh, and, and so this is actually inspired by, uh, at least partially inspired by reading uh, uh, Fu and Sellers recently within uh, the past five years or so offered a new bijective proof of McMahon's identity, along with infinite families based off of McMahon's identity, where they did a similar trick, uh, where they basically re read it as, as evens or 3 mod 6. So this is inspired by, by that trick. And so the way that we're going to describe a partition is well, first we're going to say what happens to the even parts. And the most obvious thing to do with even parts is break them in half. So, so in, your, in your partition that is, has part 0, 2, 4, 5, mod 6, anything, con anything even, just replace the even part with two copies of whatever m over 2 is. Uh, know that this is not an iterative process. Sometimes in these type of proofs, you keep doing that until you get down to just odd parts. Like if you were to have something like 12 here, that would be allowed. You send it to 6 plus 6. You don't keep, you don't keep, you don't go all the way down to 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. And so then, uh, this was, so, so, so that feels like the thing that we should be and so that should be doing. And so then the big question is what to do with the odd parts. And the odd parts are all of the form 6m sub m sub i minus 1 for some m sub i, because they're congruent to, uh, they are congruent to uh, 5 sub 5 mod 6. And so this was the trickiest part of the proof. And what and so the it was I was basically working under the assumption that the even parts have to divide in half in order for the proof to 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 work out and then the question was was well what what do the odd parts get sent to and it was basically I was again kind of working on the under the assumption that the even parts and the odd parts would behave differently that that these two maps would be done completely separately from each other. And so I, I managed to, again, I have to know where the experimentation in, in this talk is coming in. 